In the email that I got from Nature this week, uh, we have the top two pieces are an editorial, how nature contributed to science's discriminatory legacy. We want to acknowledge and learn from our history. And this is, as you might imagine, uh, the, kind of, <clears throat> the kind of thing that everyone is being expected to do now. Apologize for the, uh, the fact that our forebears were not moderns who understood all of the things about bigotry that moderns understand. And the second piece in Nature this week uh, is in the in the basically their review of this week's most important scientific things that are happening and that Nature itself published is worldview to set transgender policy look to the evidence policy debates concerning transgender people are embroiled in the culture wars let data and science not politicians guide laws this written by someone known as Paisley Kara the second article to set transgender transgender policy look to the evidence begins uh, as follows. In March, the U.S. state of Utah passed a law barring transgender girls from high school girls' sports. It defines sex as, quote, the condition of being male or female determined by an individual's genetics and anatomy at birth and prohibits those of, quote, male sex, end quote, from competing against another school on a girls' team. And this piece by, again, Paisley Kara um, <clears throat> proceeds to make a number of arguments that claim to be relying on data and science. And in this piece, there is literally no definition of sex, no purportedly scientific explanation for how humans, unique among all animals, can supposedly, unique among all mammals, can supposedly change their sex, patently no understanding of the organizational effects of hormones. The author, for instance, seems to believe that hormones only work activationally. And just a you know brief endocrinological aside here, um, one way of categorizing the effects of hormones is activational versus organizational, and min most hormones have both types of effects. An activational effect is one which, when exposed to the hormone, uh, the system that is that can respond to it, and therefore the body in which it lives, the individual in which it lives, responds immediately to the effect of that hormone. That is activational. It is basically the body is activated by the exposure to the hormone. Uh, then there are organizational effects, which is to say early in development or at other moments in development, as new systems are being laid down during development, uh, exposure to the hormone basically sets things in process such that once exposed, things are set in process which can never be undone. And it's these organizational effects of things like sex steroid hormones, especially testosterone, but also of estrogens, uh, which are widely, almost universally, I think, ignored, and certainly ignored by the author of this piece, which gets such a, a highlight uh, position in nature this week, um, when they talk about whether or not you can actually be truly, um, truly turn into the other sex. The fact is that if you went through puberty as a male, uh, you cannot undo all of that simply by taking uh, cross-sex hormones or, um, or even by taking puberty blockers because many of the organizational effects of testosterone you actually underwent in utero and in early childhood. So it strikes me here that um, the reality is even worse than you're portraying it, and you, you hint at it here. Okay. Um, you cannot I'm have... trying not to get out of control. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot have both arguments. You cannot pretend that the only impacts mm. are activational, yes. right? And thereby say, well, if we change your hormone profile, we've changed you into the other sex. And also say that it is important that people transition early, right? That we cannot afford to delay uh, transition because that will have permanent impacts on the people who um, who don't get the treatments early. So the point is, if it is true, and it is true, that blocking puberty uh, has an important impact, then it is because there are organizational effects which you then cannot pretend uh, have been eliminated by um, some late-in-life treatment. That's exactly it's, it's right. It's purely contradictory. That's exactly right. Uh, I think that's that's very important, and uh, just to to reiterate also the point I made, which is that the organizational effects of testosterone do not do not the first time that they rear their heads is not in puberty, right? Right, that they begin in utero, 
uh, with uh, basically beginning the process of the formulation of primary sex characteristics. And also there's another surge of basically sex differentiation. And I think it's toddlerhood, so somewhere around like two to three years, if I remember correctly. And I didn't go back and look exactly, so I may have that a little bit off. Um, and then there is a period of time in, um, you know, after toddlerhood, but sort of early childhood through what we would think of as like elementary school and early middle school years, uh, at least as far as schooling goes here in the U.S., where uh, the sex hormones, the sex steroid hormones aren't that active. Um, but it's not that they haven't already been so. And you cannot undo organizational effects. Can you mitigate the activational effects of something by taking that something away? For sure. You can, in fact, possibly reverse it entirely. But uh, testosterone, estrogens, and many other hormones as well don't simply have activational effects. So the argument, um, the argument falls apart. This in a piece that claims um, <clears throat> that what it wants us to be doing is, again, to look at the uh, sub-headline. And you can show us again, Zach. It's going to be a little while before I ask you to screenshot again. Um, <clears throat> is that we, he wants... I think I think this person Paisley. Yeah, Paisley. I don't honestly know. Um, Paisley wants data and science, not politicians, to guide laws. Well, well, Paisley, I got bad news for you then, uh, because uh, you can cherry pick all of the crap articles that you want, and you did so in this piece, uh, and that does not change the fact that sex in animals is binary, and in mammals, uh, you we do not change sex, and this does not. This does not belie the evidence, uh, the existence of intersex people very occasionally, that's development due to developmental anomalies, nor to very, very occasional trans people who can, in order to get better alignment between their perceived sex and their actual sex, um, try to do everything they can to live as the sex that they are not, but they will never be the sex that they are not. Again, it's somewhat logically worse than this because <laughs> Um, as you and I have pointed out many times, transness exists in many cultures. It is real. It is extremely rare. But the fact that it exists, that it is apparently not the product of some sort of modern distortion of the world, means that uh, obviating the activational effects isn't even necessary for trans people to play their role and live out a transitioned life. You mean the organizational effects? either, frankly. Okay. But I guess my point would be, we have modern tools, right? Mm -hmm. We can supplement your testosterone, for example, should you want that. It is apparently not necessary to transness, what transness has been, right? It is a modern uh, opportunity that is apparently not fundamental here, right? We cannot fully change the, uh, the organizational effects. We have some ability to mitigate the activational effects, but none of that is necessary, and certainly surgery even less so. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the problem is, like um, all dishonest political movements, mm -hmm. trans activists want the benefit of part of an argument, and they want to ignore the corollaries of it. And That's right. this is just simply and, not how logic works. It doesn't belong in nature, for one thing. Yeah, in, in the journal Nature. Yeah. Yeah, and, and of course, Nature, who presumably wrote the headline, not Paisley, Kara, um, <clears throat> is claiming that this is the argument that comes from science, when it's exactly the opposite. You know, the, the claim is, don't do the politics, do the science, when what the trans activists are doing is the politics, not the science. Right. So they're doing exactly the thing that they're screaming about. I, you know, the, t the tone in this paper is not screaming. I don't mean that Paisley is screaming, but there's certainly a lot of screaming in trans activist land. And uh, it, is, it is almost always claiming that other people are doing the very thing that they are doing. So... For instance, um, there's a reference, there, there's scant references at all, or even scientifically backed claims in this, <clears throat> in this worldview piece. Um, but one piece that is cited is a piece from 2019 called Gender Identity, Non-Discrimination Laws and Public Accommodations, a Review of Evidence Regarding Safety and Privacy in Public Restrooms, Locker Rooms, and Changing Rooms. Well, that sounds impressive, doesn't it? I'm not going to go into it here. I made a bunch of snarky notes here uh, about the 
fully crap statistics and the claims that aren't backed up by even what they show in the paper. Um, but I will show this little bit of sleazy language since I can't, um, can't show my screen here. Quote from this paper from 2019, Hassenbush et al. Critiques of anti-LGBT policies are abounding. Fogg Davis, 2017, for example, argues for the abolishment of using sex as a criterion for separating facilities. Let me say that again. Proudly, this paper is saying we are seeing an increase in critique of anti-LGBT policies. Isn't that great? What is their go-to example of an anti-LGBT policy? Using sex as a criterion for separating facilities. Sorry, no. And this actually reminds me, and I, I don't know if we have a whole lot that we know to say about this, but of there was a protest that happened in Vermont today um, by an alliance that identifies as an LGB alliance, um, <clears throat> including people who were at the original Stonewall riots, who have been long-term proponents of, of gay rights and increasingly now women's rights and children's rights, who see the tacking on of the T and the Q and the pluses into this originally movement about gay rights as actually um, not simply taking space, but actually overturning many of the many of the gains that not just gays made, but also women have made and uh, children as well. Yep, and again, I mean, it's uh, it is a permanent state in this uh, style of argument. But again, the idea that in one sentence. Um, the differences between the sexes are so important that one must be able to avail themselves of technological interventions to move from one sex to the other in the same breath as, and isn't it uh, a crime that we use sex as a delineator for access to facilities? The point is either sex is important and therefore it makes sense that we would use it uh, as a criterion for entering certain facilities or it isn't important in which case what's all this transitioning business what are yeah. you transitioning from and to right 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 yeah. yes so, um, yeah no the the hypocrisy and incoherence is is skin deep well it, it's <laughs> not even it, it's something else it is a habitual desire to have part but not all of a logical argument Right. Yeah. It is a mm -hmm. it is a surgical separation of a logical argument from some of its logical consequences, mm -hmm. and that is evidence of bad faith. I mean, yes. it just simply is. Yes. And this is also a, a corollary. We, we have talked about the fact that you own the downsides of your own arguments, mm. and this is one of these things, which is if you're going to you know invoke sex in one sentence in order to justify uh, intervention for transitions, you can't then decry its existence in the second. Right. Right? It's right. one or the other.